It's the Leaning Tired Cast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, talk about a topic, try to look at it from every conceivable angle in the abstract, and then wind down with some ways to put this all this thinking into action. We think hard about visual storytelling, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other guy is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger, a coder and designer. How are mm. you doing, Jersey? Coder and designer. Mm -hmm. You finally found a two-word succinct way to describe what you do. <laughs> I suppose I can I can easily slip back into uh, awkward paragraphs at a moment's notice. <laughs> oh, I only took 115 episodes. Hey, good to be back. I mean, I guess this is our first episode, the two of us, uh, since, gosh, a month, mm -hmm. hasn't it? Just the two of us, yep. <laughs> we don't have to get romantic about it. I know. <laughs> I'm excited, Rob, but, uh, well, but, but yeah. Yeah, it's hey, been a while. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's good to see you again, and um, I'm excited about doing the show together. And um, speaking of exciting, normally we kick off with a curveball, but this time I'm, I'm I am going to suggest that we front end some announcements about the show, this this visual storytelling show that we do. I uh, think that's an awesome idea. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad we are agreed on this. So, what is this thing that we did, Rob? <laughs> what oh have we wrought? Um, so it's it's we actually. We want to be starting something. Honestly, we uh, we went. Speaking of all eighty sound references, we we started a uh, an art challenge, which is kind of funny that it took us a while. Where we sort of launched with one in a way, like the big splash as far as you know drawing attention to this uh, you know podcast and project that we've we've been up to was thirty classes in thirty days back in twenty eleven, right? Mm -hmm. And it took I us remember. a while. But we we've, we've come back around to figuring out what I think you know may just be like a sustainable art challenge, um, but with a different theme. So what's it called, Rob? It's called Art Sound Off. And that's at artsoundoff.com. dot com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good place to get a you know get an overview, get some samples. What's this whole thing about? And the gist of it is, it, it's about um, celebrating, practicing, and spreading. Uh, doing some reflection on the the stuff that you're making, which is just right up our alley. <laughs> Honestly, it's kind of funny it took us this while long to come up with that one, but I'm I'm really stoked we did. You know, and actually, uh, credit where credits due. This was a this was was a text from Jersey one night where I, where near the end of a uh, last month's art challenge, and I was, I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this is this is so good. I think we're about to go go again. <laughs> yeah, here we around. go again. I, you know, yeah, when I texted changes. you, it took you a couple of days to get back to me, and I was like, "Oh, it must not have been a very good idea." <laughs> no, you you knocked me you knocked me out, knocked me offline with that excellent thought. So, no, it, it's um so it it a little bit of noodling and and uh, spreading the word later. Uh, here we are. It's it's the sixth of November, and uh, there's there's a good uh, there's a good you know little number of us putting out some. Um, some essentially audio journals, um, just about every day, and sharing them. With, and then we're doing so with the hashtag Art Sound Off. And really, that's the whole recipe. It's not. It's not any more complicated than that. Yeah, it's it's really straightforward. Just record an, uh, an audio journal of your art day every day for the month of November. And I should say that we we set it as a challenge just for ourselves primarily. And I'm going to pull up the link to the Polytechnicast, Rob's microcast. And where where the heck is mine? Um, we're 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 uh, doing an experiment this time by using the Google Hangouts Showcase app to see if we can just show some of these links in a sidebar while we talk about them rather than typing them into the chat. Hmm. But uh, the Polytechnicast is at interactive-storyteller.com slash poly Polytechnicast. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, Thunder Punch Daily, which I just found and I'm posting into the, the Showcase app, is at comicsaregreat.com. So we just set out to do slash, it. And it's slash TPD, right? Mm, maybe. <laughs> I can check. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> Could be wrong. It might have been a short link that I created using like mm. the Pretty Link plugin in WordPress, but uh, let's just go to comicsaregreat.com slash TPD. I bet that does take you there. But um, And you can find it on iTunes, and you can find it on our Patreon page at uh, patreon.com slash leanintoart. And that's where we're, Rob and I are posting uh, our microcasts as well. Um, 
Yeah. But yeah, we it just totally set out works. to do, we set out to challenge ourselves with this thing. We're like, well, we'll just do it. And we'll see if we can Tom Sawyer some people into this. And like within a couple of days, like a whole bunch of people were participating in this thing. It's super cool. So you can follow along, listen along by going to Twitter or to any of the social networks and looking for the art sound off hashtag. Actually, Twitter seems to be the best place. That seems to be the place where everybody's posting their stuff from what I've seen. Yeah, that's um, that's definitely convenient, right? I mean, it's not like we're sitting here uh, convitter, uh, t- con- convitter, having conversations on Twitter <laughs> is just a really convenient place. And uh, convittering is that is that yeah, what it is? Convitter, a did I just, <laughs> uh, I verbified a thing. Yep, exactly. Uh, and anyway, yeah, it's it is convenient. So you know, we can call that the official uh, water cooler for this for this event. Yeah, I'm cool with that. I like it. And it's been fun to listen to, you know, people who, you know, have never done this before, like just take to it like a fish to water. It's great. It's super, super fun. So if you're looking for a lot of podcasts to listen to, there you go. You got like a constant stream daily of uh, your fellow cartoonists, illustrators, designers, painters, and you name it, uh, talking and sharing uh, the reflections on the art day. So, mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else to say about Art Sound Off, Rob, or should we get into Curveball? No, uh, one, the one thing I wanted to add is if you're curious and you want to try it out, I mean, the intent behind this isn't about, you know, making it, uh, um, you know, we're climbing this big mountain, it's a machismo mountain, and every step of the way we're pounding our chests and we're like, yeah, bro fives and all that stuff, whatever a bro five is. And uh, it, it's it's just, hey, um, let, let's let's try this out. And uh, whatever um, whatever you have time for or interest, uh, doing one is fine, right? I mean, this is this is uh, um, what I what I've seen. It's 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 a good catalyst. That's true, but uh, but it's not it's not about like you know getting a high score or something at the end of it. It's just uh, give it a shot if you're still curious about it. Yeah, November started. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I like Bro Five. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds sweaty uh, <laughs> but but yes yes whatever whatever time you can afford and and like a, you know another thing you can do is if you don't want to participate you can interact with you know and you can bro five the people who are participating you know to <laughs> egg them on uh no, it's no definitely sweat. an egging on thing yep yeah uh, okay, well, cool. So artsoundoff.com, it will be linked in the show notes. The month of November, you get a whole mm-hmm. bunch of extra stuff from me and Rob and a whole bunch of different leaners, people who interact with the show in a really positive way. And thanks to everybody who's been playing along. It's not only is it super encouraging that you guys, like, you know, thought it was a fun challenge, but it's neat to see, to hear from people who do listen to the Lean Entire cast. You know, even if it's not directed immediately at us. It's neat just to hear the voices. I mean, there's people from Eastern Europe who are participating in this thing. I was like, I didn't know anybody, you know, outside oh, yeah. of the United States listen to this thing. I mean, it makes sense, but you don't think about it. No. Yeah, well, it, it o- is. Owen Jollins is from the UK too, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's certainly one of the benefits of uh, of podcasting is that, yeah, we do this live broadcast, but you and I aren't even in the same time zones. And then clearly... I mean, we've interacted with listeners that are actually, yeah, throughout the world. And that's been, uh, yeah, that, that's just one of the awesome benefits of podcasting, which others who give this Art Sound Off event a try, you'll you'll notice that too. Yep. Yep. All right. So curveball time, Rob. Yep. Here we go. I see in the notes that you have one for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Actually, By the way, curveball, if you're new to the show, curveball is an intellectual warm-up exercise question without an answer where we try not to come up with some kind of pat, succinct, uh, recipe-style answer for th- things that are uh, you know, troubling or interesting or complex about visual storytelling. Just a way for us to stretch out before we dive into the main topic. So, with that, hit me, Rob. All right. I have three, but I will start with the third and see what happens from there, okay? All right. And... <clears throat> they are reflective in nature, so they're less about a some kind of unanswerable Cohen. It's more of a. Uh, um, I'm I'm really curious about your thoughts on. Okay, so art sound off, and you've been, you know, cranking them out every day. Have you been surprised about anything? About um, surprised by yourself. Mm. With anything you've done with art sound off yet, 
and then why or why not? The thing, uh, well, it, this ties into the one I just posted today, uh, the Thunder Punch Daily, where upon doing them daily again for five days, I realized that my reflex is to try to shape my reporting as an essay. I try to, I, I, I look at what's, what I've been doing in the day, what I've got to mm. do in the day, and I'm like, what's the theme? What's the big idea of what I'm thinking about today? And the truth is, days don't really have themes. You can find them. You can find smaller themes and stuff. But like, you don't wake up today and it's like, okay, this is the this is the day is going to be the comedy, right? It's not preordained, and it's it's like something you find after the fact. But uh, I've been surprised by how comfortable I don't want to say comfortable. Uh, what's the word for it? Uh, how reflexive it is for me to always try to shape the narrative somehow. Um, and then, so today, I tried to not do that. I said, you know, Ooh. I'm just going to tell you guys what's happening with my day, and let's see what comes out of that. It may just me give, be giving you a laundry list. Um, but what, why I was surprised by that realization came out of the fact that in listening to everybody else's, there were people who were just talking about their day, and it was immensely interesting to me. And then, which led to the question, why don't I do that? Um, why is my reflex to try to craft some kind of overarching narrative why am i always looking for a theme so i don't have any answer to that yet that is maybe something I can go into a future thunder punch daily but uh hmm. right now my only guess is that it's that like it's my way of attempting to create something that is of use to somebody else with no evidence to support that that is the case right hmm. uh so, I don't know. It needs, needs some more thinking about. Uh, that's okay. Well, maybe, maybe that's that's. Uh, I honestly, I, I, how you process things, I, I consider that a, you know a, a cleanly hit curveball. Yet I, I do like the open endedness with it, as well. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, we the month has only just begun. Yet I do feel this mounting pressure of, uh, boy, am I going to get extra ex, uh, extemporaneous here. <laughs> pretty soon uh cuz yeah i think you are excellent at finding a point that i debate myself on this and and there's a there's a um uh there is a uh, sort of a um a cognitive bias called hindsight bias where it's it's also called um knew it all along effect or creeping determinism Whereas you can end up, end up forming a narrative from just what you did or what you said, and that's just that's one of the reasons why stories are so darn pow powerful because we we just we say things after other things and after other things, and then we're like, well, okay, things that follow things must have meaning, right? And we, especially when you practice uh, journaling, I think you you may get overdeveloped muscles in in this kind of bias, right? That's uh, that I get worried about. I don't think you do it though. I seriously think you do find a. Um, you're more like I don't know what to call it. It's like um, reflective. Um, what's like one? Of, what were those uh, pros prospector? There you go. Because I'm picturing like what grizzled, you know, grizzly beard and like that. Like, like I'm, saying, pan, I'm, I'm, I'm actually you know? chewing that that old man imaginary gum, going while I'm like <laughs> sifting gold through a pan. You totally pull out the gold and you're like super skilled prospector I what you know seriously that so I'm trying to you know anyway I, th I think about that and I I, I um I don't know if I worry about it but I like to um I like to think about that like am I just sort of making up the connections or am I finding the things and you do oh. find things where I'm like dang that was really useful that's cool well I'm glad to hear that but no I, I worry about the exact same thing I mean I worry about like am I just making stuff up after the fact and and I think a lot of times you are like when you're looking back at your life and you hear people say like oh it's as if there was a there was a plan there was a path well part of that is because you survived it <laughs> and yeah. you know we we do in, in, impose meaning on a lot of stuff right uh, oh it's a sign it's a sign the song came on the radio just at the right time it's a sign you know we're looking for that meaning all the time um, so yeah, I, I'm, I am certain that I am doing that at least part of the time. I can't give you a percentage of when I'm doing that. 
Um, but if it's useful storytelling that helps somebody else process information, who am I to argue with that? You know, like this is something that came up when the episode, oh gosh, it was Comics Are Great. I was, I was doing the Comics Are Great show with, with um, Zach Giolongo, episode 106, and it's in the YouTube feed, but it's not in the podcast feed at the time of this recording. But um, one of the things I was, I was sharing was a story from my classroom that you were in on, Rob. You were in this private discussion I was having with some people who I trust about how to deal with the situation where there was this little girl who was attending the class every week, but she was not drawing. And I was hell-bent on getting this kid to draw because she must be getting something out of the class. She, she, she clearly wants to be there or unless mom and dad are saying, hey, we pay for this class, you're going. But she wasn't demonstrating any kind of interest in actually drawing anything with the other kids. And so uh, somebody gave me the advice of telling a story of how I took a risk and shared something that I was afraid of getting, you know, uh, af afraid of sharing. And somebody gave me a useful insight that actually helped my career or helped my work in some positive way. And I, and I trumped up a story. I made up a story uh, using, I brought in a, a comic that I drew in fifth grade, you know, to like demonstrate, like, look how bad I used to be. You know, look how rotten my art used to be. And I made up the story about how I shared it, and because I shared it at right, just the right time, you know, this wonderful thing happened in my work, and the kids started drawing, right? Now, am I a liar? Uh, or am I a storyteller in that situation, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, that's, uh, hmm. Yeah, I, I'm going to play, I'm going to pull a story, storyteller card on that. It's, uh, yeah. I, I can see an argument for both sides on that. But, I mean, so that's what I think about when I think about, like, am I imposing meaning on this stuff? Maybe. But as long as it's remotely useful to somebody else, then great. And so far, I haven't gotten a ton of feedback saying, like, oh, this has been immensely useful to me, outside of what you just said, Rob. But uh, I also haven't heard anybody say, like, this is useless junk. So right now, all evidence points to, you're doing fine, Jers. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Did, did we did we cur did we walk around that curveball? Totally walked around that. All right, then I think if it's all the same to you, Rob, I think it's time we hit to main topic. And oh, I was supposed to ten thousand feet. Up. Looking at the topic in abstract, American Steve Wang looking for hidden dimensions, depths, and uh, you know, complexities, and then. You know, in the second half of the show, we'll get down to curveball, or I mean, uh, into uh, on the ground, and we will uh, talk about how to put this stuff into use. But what's the topic? What's the topic, Rob, that we're going to discuss in abstract? Abstract. Uh, let's see. Essentially, it's. I think we're talking about the the sort of the the habit of research, and a couple of different key applications for it. So, um, researching as far as uh, accumulating knowledge, and then I think then some of that is the um, sort of immediate use, and then perhaps the ongoing habit of it as well. Long-time listeners will remember that we have addressed this topic in the past, uh, episode 53 in 2012, so two years ago at the time of this recording. Uh, episode 88, we talked about writing in the cloud, and, uh, like research and writing with an emphasis on cloud services, mm -hmm. and that was in October of 2013, so it was a little over a year ago. And then we did episode 85 with Andros, uh, where we talked about organizing our files and, and you know, uh, different file management strategies and metadata strategies. So this is an odd, another and an ongoing series. Because, and the reason I think that it's okay to go back to these topics and look at them afresh is because it's been a while. And, I'm, and technology's changed. We've changed. We've learned new things. So I'm curious how our thinking has changed and how our methodology mm -hmm. has changed in terms of doing research for projects. Um, where do you want to start, Rob? Do you want to start? With, you, you came up with some really interesting distinctions between like different the different... Because, like, when somebody says research, research, they're like, what are you researching for? Are you researching for a book? Uh, are you doing a nonfiction book that you want to? Or are you researching for school? I mean, what, what, what other things would you be researching for? Uh, well, in, in some ways, I think we have the option, and I think some of us have the habits, um, and for me, my habits have changed over time, of being some form of just the habitual, you know, data pack rat. But I think... Um, we're, we're looking for more of the details of, of like uh, a, a useful thing that you're storing to get, get back to later. Right. Um, and likely going to apply it in some way. So I like to think of it as, um, 
uh, or at least when I took the fresh look at it based on, on, on working on for, you know, for this preparing for this show is, um, you know, in one area you could be taking on new activities and um, maybe enjoy just the ongoing pursuit of new activities. And that would be where you're, you're sort of a perpetual transitioner from, from, you know, becoming aware than a novice and a beginner and, uh, you know, looking at, um, let's see, what is that called? The Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. Oh, um, run this past me. The Dreyfus model of skill acquisition is essentially a way to, um, like, it's like five levels, five designations as far as how um, capable you are with a given skill. And then you would begin at, uh, oh, gosh, I don't have them all memorized off the top of my head, but it goes from novice to beginner to competent. And then I forget the next two levels. <laughs> um, where, like, I think the fifth level is Yoda. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I forget. So that that to me is very like um, the classic. Uh, what do you call it? like an autodidact? You know, you're being autodidactish if you're doing that. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, yeah, I just I study things and they caught my eye, and some I keep practicing till I get till I you know learn more about it, and others I just you know move on because there's a new thing. And then the second distinction is, um, I was thinking it was it was more of a mission based where it's like maybe maybe you're working on a project or you're consulting or um you know doing something that is just executing focused more than more than that ongoing practice thing where it's uh um you know you're just using the but then i kind of think there's maybe two levels of it that's why and i split it into two where, where maybe it's not exactly two but one is like the the mechanical aspect of you're using an outboard memory and you're being very uh workflow hackerish where it's like um i've got my tools that augment my capabilities and i i batman out evernote once in a while and i um you know, reach into NV Alt or whatever your whatever is working for you to like um, enhance your your skills by making your memory stronger, and uh, you know, keeping this enriched pile of data nearby and handy. Then I think there's sort of the um, combining both, which again I'm not sure if it's precisely a separate distinction, but well, you know, before you go there, so it, it, I just want to make sure I understand workflow hacker that category. So this is like professional development, ongoing development of your skills for something that you're just con- consistently pursuing. Uh, this is, yeah, it's like you're thinking about it, um, uh, always swapping in and out tools or um, improving skill with a given tool because it is, it's helping you do your research better. So maybe you're accumulating things better or maybe you're organizing things better. Um and it's somehow, um, you know, it's 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 a it's an enhancement, not not necessarily um, like you've internal. I, I don't know what to say. It's, it it really is tool focused. Maybe maybe that's the key point with that one. Okay, so the first category is about learning a new skill. The second one is more about like ex- uh, consistently exploring tools to enhance the skills that you already ex- uh, already have. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's for further development, you know, leveling up. Mm-hmm. All right. And so th- then the third one I was thinking is more the um uh let's say you have a client come along or a contract and you you know you have a foundation in that service area. Like you're, you know, it's like, "Oh, okay, this is this is the, you know, um writing a particular type of story or it's illustrating a a certain kind of book, but like it may be out of your normal comfort zone. It may be a stretch, right? And then you're in the situation where, Hey, it's really time to learn and you're super accountable for learning that, uh, and, and, and doing it well, where you're more of a, you're not completely brand new to it, but you're like more of an adaptive expert where, um, and you're doing that because you're working for hire. Yeah, um, this would yeah. be when I was working on the Warren Commission report. <laughs> or it's like, guess sure. what? You're drawing a book about the Kennedy assassination. I did not think that sentence was going to happen. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, 
let's do it. Let's learn as much as I can about this this subject matter and let's collect as much reference material as possible uh, because I'm going to be drawing a lot of scenes inside of Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, right? Um, so at the end of that process or like partway during that, you likely were um, changing in your skills, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I reported on that when we did the episode with Dan Michigan uh, talking about the Warren Commission report is that one of the things I learned was like Ernie Cologne's way of setting up shots. It was completely different from mine, and now I have an, a new way of approaching it. Like I can ask when I'm stuck on something, well, what would Ernie do? And that gives that me a new cool. way to, to solve problems on the page. Well, and there's also the topic as well. Were you, were you previously a heavily versed... Um, so Kennedy era historian. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so yeah, like now I know a lot more about a certain piece of American history. You know, uh, I know about you know Officer Baker on the po police motorcycle who went into the Texas School Book Depository after he heard the shots ring. You know, mm. I didn't know about that whole little bit before. I didn't know about the the shoe store owner who spotted Oswald walking by uh, right after he killed the policeman uh, on, in that residential area. So yeah, yeah, I learned a lot too uh, about the subject matter as well as picking up new skills. So. Hmm. And uh, and and so maybe that does hold water as a as a separate one, right? Because you're 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 picking up new skills to apply current skills. Is another yes. way to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, and then that's yeah. Those distinctions, I don't think they have to you know govern all all the things, but like that, I thought that that was kind of a handy framework for like why are you doing this research thing, you know? Right. And and the way we want to approach this is to address all like address it in a way that it's useful to all those different skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's taking on a new, a new skill, like, like for instance, you know, it's like, I don't know if this is, if this is getting, is this severe, Rob? Tell me if you think this is severe. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I mean, explain. okay. I'll, I'll explain. You can tell me if it's severe and then, and then the leaders can tell me if they think it's severe. But like, I think it's interesting to just learn things for, for the pure, fun of learning things sometimes so like for instance uh in 2001 uh i remember just spending a lot of time on different forums learning about how to encode vcds you know what those are <laughs> yes they were really popular in asia honestly they they were they didn't hit that well over here but no they didn't they didn't but what it was was it was it was like just around the same time when dvds kind of started catching on uh, there was a way to encode video onto CDs, compact discs, which only have, what, 750 megabytes on them? No, not even that much. Yeah, and those were the extended format. They started out with, I think, 600 or 650. Okay. But th there was, like, all these mm -hmm. tricks you could do with all this free software on Windows to, like, monkey with compression and, you know, turn it into an MPEG-2. And I don't know why, but I was just fascinated by that technology, and, and I learned everything I could about different tricks to encode, and then I even got, like, a special video card for my PC to route my cable into so I could do live encodings, recordings of cartoon shows that were airing. <laughs> I still have them. I have I have all of the 2001 series Robots in Disguise Transformers uh, encoded the VCD, um, which I would I would <laughs> I would you know encode live and then take out the commercials. Okay, so why right? Why why even do that? Well, because it was interesting, and uh, I was talking with Anne about this a couple weeks ago, and she was saying how like that's just something that's hardwired into me where I get really interested in stuff and I seek out these things, and that's why she she was proposing that. I have a little bit of an easier time than some of my friends, nobody present, uh, that about like taking on new skills. Like if it's like, oh, I got to learn a new thing. It's like I don't resist it as much because I've done it for fun on the side, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. So that's that's the thing I was worried about. Is that is that like a severe judgment to say that? I don't know. But oh, that sounds quite the opposite. That sounds pretty gentle. I mean, what would be, what sounds severe of, about it to you? Because it's, it's suggesting that you should just go learn stuff for learning's sake, which I don't think is a severe thing to say, but some people tend to like brace their, their heels about that, right? Uh, yeah, I suppose, right? I mean, so a, a, a severe, preg I mean, so, so I, I, I tend to, to 
um, I, I call myself pragmatic, but like a severe pragmatist in my understanding is uh, like would, would would say you have wasted your life by doing that, right? I mean, that's unless I'm misunderstanding what pragmatists right, are like. Right, right. Yeah, that, that VCD knowledge has benefited my life in no tangible way outside of flexing a muscle that I have since used in other arenas, not the muscle of the skill of video encoding, but the, the skill of knowing that I can find the information I need to and I can solve the problems as they come, right? And you just described why it's super valuable. <laughs> and that's... Uh, <laughs> That's the that, that's what is it's so tempting to characterize uh, quirks and habits of of collecting and exploring things just for the sake of them as uh, trivial. Yet, especially when you find a way to get like okay, so uh, let's let's go back to the um, the Dreyfus um, model for skill acquisition. You were definitely not leaving your, you know, stopping at novice or beginner or even competent. It sounds like you went, you know, I'm, I'm guessing level five is uh, more like expert or whatever. Now I'm totally going to look it up while we're talking, but right. um, it's, uh, it, so, so what you were at least a four or five, right? Auto, I don't know. You know I mean, scale it, of five. sure. Four? Sure. I mean, I, I, I had been using a lot of different kinds of software and I knew the difference between bit rate, frame rate and uh, you know, how to do, uh, you know, different kinds of tricks with interpolation and stuff like that to like make the video look as good as possible, but be as compressed as possible at the time. Um, I don't remember all that stuff anymore, but, but I was, I was good enough at it that, you know, that I, like I was conversant in it. If anybody wanted to talk with me about, uh, MPEG files. Aha. Uh -huh. So, so you were either th maybe three or four, right? Where, so maybe. at, at, at three, you, um, Let's see. You can cope with the multiple activities or the accumulation of information. You can, you have some perception of the actions relative to your, to the goals. You do deliberate planning and you can formulate routines. But at four, when you become proficient, that's the one I keep forgetting. And four is proficient. Five is expert. Um, okay. Also known as Yoda. But um, then uh, at four, you have a holistic view of the situation, and you can prioritize the importance of aspects of it. So you're more nuanced. As you're in your expertise, right? Yeah. And uh, you could be evaluating trade-offs in a very informed manner, I would expect. And, um, yeah, and I was you can, not there. I was not there, but... Oh, okay. And, well, I think you were close. Maybe you were three and a half, because then it also said you can employ maxims for guidance uh, with meanings that adapt to the situation at hand. Huh. So, I don't know. So, don't in... Know. Yeah, anyway, this is whatever. It's a model, right? Models are models. They're like abstractions, helpful tools to understand. You know, it's a thought tool, right? I mean, and I'm not, I'm no expert on, on using this, but, um, well, no, I'm not an expert. I'm, uh, to get meta, I'm probably competent <laughs> on using the, <laughs> I'm somewhere between advanced beginner and competent on using the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. But anyway, um, but let's see. So I mean, so there, there you go. Like the skill of learning skills is is a pretty darn powerful capability, right? And yeah. so the 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 experience of getting to three or four um, versus always shopping around and staying at one, there's a pretty huge difference there. Okay, can we talk about addressing this this whole idea of skill acquisition from the standpoint of the novice? Let's go back to the. Gotcha. Right. Let's go back to the Dreyfus level one. Mm. Um, and there's two, and, and this, this is a totally, you know, like by bi nothing is binary uh, when it comes to discussing these topics, but let's, let's make it binary just for the, the purposes of clarity. Um, starting a thing can be exciting and starting a thing can be challenging, right? Mm -hmm. Want to pick up a new skill? Uh, I think of, again, I always quote this, the C.S. Lewis book, uh, the, the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, as lands addressing Peter and Edmund, uh, telling them about all the dangerous things that they're going to have to do when the, snow, the, the White Queen shows up. And when Edmund hears Aslan's words, he hears danger. And when Peter hears Aslan's words, he hears adventure, right? Uh, it's like th there's a nice, clear way of thinking about like the differences be between mindsets when taking a challenge. Now, there's there's pros and cons to both of those, and I just think it's important just to like address them and acknowledge them 
It's like mm-hmm. when you start a new thing, you just want to dive in and do the thing. I just want to, I'm going to start, you know, making VCDs. I'm going to start skateboarding. I'm going to start swimming. Uh, I just want to just do it, right? Because it looks like so much fun and I'm sure I'll figure it out along the way, right? Um, and in those, can, when that mindset, the research can be incomplete, haphazard. Uh, but then if, you, if you're if you one of the people who come from the Edmund line of thought of like danger, uh you want to make sure you're ready. I got to line up all, I got to get every book on the subject. I got to print out all these things from, from webmonkey.com because I'm going to learn HTML after all. And I need to make sure that I have all this stuff in a binder. So I am prepared for any eventuality. And when something goes wrong, I want to be able to look it up. Right. Um, <laughs> but how much is too much? Are you using this as an opportunity to procrastinate from just that, from, from a, ever engaging with the skill that you're trying to learn or the material you're trying to learn? Right. Um, Hmm. So, question. How do we navigate between those two things? I think I found myself oscillating between those two things depending on the subject. Um, I just chronicled this on the Thunder Punch Daily recently where, um, you know, I was doing a lot of gear shifting between different projects and I was and I was having a decent time or, or I was doing a decent job of staying focused even though, like, in the morning I was writing this and then in the afternoon I was coloring this and then I had to go talk to somebody about this. Um, all very different skill sets that I was employing. But um, I was making the observation that it's like, well, but I've done all these things a lot. So it's not as hard for me to switch between those things. But about a month ago, I had to work on a project that was completely outside of my wheelhouse. It, 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 was, it was drawing, so I knew I could do it. But it was drawing things that I wasn't familiar with drawing. It was, in, it was something that I had a subject I had a lot of reverence and respect for. But I never tried drawing those things before. And I was locking up. I was freezing up about like, oh, I better look at every conceivable picture of these particular things I have to draw because I got to get it right. I got to get it right. And I found myself using that as an opportunity to procrastinate uh, from diving in and doing the thing. So I've been on both ends of the spectrum on this. And I'm wondering where you tend to fall and what you think is a healthy approach to navigate between those two poles. Hmm. This is... This is territory where I like to tread cautiously. Um, you know, like if I'm uh, hanging out in a relaxing context, I can certainly feel um, some uh, passionate advocacy, maybe even bravado and all that stuff on the topic. But like, on but my relationship with this this sort of this circumstance has changed a lot over the years. Where if uh, um, let's see. Not to oversimplify, but I I think there's a um, it's it's in a way uh, the perfectionist's dilemma of you know how do I finish a thing versus how do I do the right thing and to do it to do the best thing as the right thing and th- those those kinds of matters and. Uh, <sighs> The per- perfectionists that that are functioning um, business people and, and are able to to you know please clients and whatnot, I think f- have have tools to work around some of those perfectionist concerns, things like editors and feedback loops, and essentially um, th- what would be probably deemed failure in in some regard would be just well, but you're failing privately a lot to then eventually succeed publicly, right? So you can use um, you can use different um, working habits to get around that. And so the um, I do think that there's multiple ways how um, either because you mentioned gear shifting, you mentioned the um, the adventure versus danger, which is a lot like I think a perfectionist dilemma uh, potentially. Um, but then also there's, a, there's, there's yet another layer where those are just two different motivations for, um, being ready in a way independent of being a perfectionist because the adventurer can be a perfectionist. The, the, um, the person, the, so the more, uh, cavalier person is probably not less likely to be a perfectionist, but, um, you know, could be. And then the person seeing the, the, the high risks I, I think is way more likely to be a perfectionist. Um, yes, but it's but it's not you know mutually exclusive. I think. Anyway, that's uh, 
that's not even getting close to answering your question, but am I starting to frame it in a way that seems Yeah, you're framing it up. You're framing functional? it up. Okay. Um, let's see. So I, I see the the stepping back to like what what we looked at in the beginning of our conversation is essentially, well, why are you doing that practice or research? Uh, that can really inform, well, what what should you expect out of it? And what sort of resources are, are um, what sort of resources in your estimation are appropriate to put into it? Okay. And with experience, I'm sure that you get a better sense of that, taking on new challenges, conquering those challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the challenge facing an autodidact, self-taught, self-motivated person is they don't, if, when you're starting on something new, you don't know what's reasonable. You have no context on that. And I think about, you know, that's, that is one of the nice things about schools is there's somebody there presumably with more experience than you who can help you get to where you need to be. Um, they, they, they are aware of what you're ignorant about, Right. Uh, or they should sure. be if they're a good teacher. Yeah. They they can identify that, oh, you don't know this yet. Uh, this is what I need to teach you next. Uh, but when you are floundering about on your own, you aren't aware of what you're ignorant about. Um, or do you? Or is there a way to for some the self-taught person to discover what they don't know yet? Find a way to produce evidence. What do you right, mean? so the this a school a, stu, a a school circumstance could could um, um, you could benefit from something I call, um, I mean it's it's a qualitative kind of evidence, you know, something that's soft, but you you get expert review if it's if it's um, if you're in the right sort of school situation, where someone who who has been tested and pursued that similar path to a far greater extent is able to look back and and um, advocate for you and understand where you're at on that path and give you some honest feedback and that feedback I, I all these are so the evidence word I just threw out is essentially you, know, you could replace it with feedback um, and so expert review is one form of it but then another one would be to um, see the reaction of people who if you're finding a way to essentially um, you know fail privately or fail more quietly so uh, stand-up comedians when they're testing out new material they do not I'm not an expert on the topic but in you know listening to a book or two on it it's um, they, they, they will typically go to you know smaller venues when a band is kicking off when they are kicking off a tour they don't immediately go to a stadium they typically start out uh, at a bar or you know something that's like a like a medium-ish venue if they've really been around a long time um, and that's essentially a way to say like for them their success is all about well live performance and whatever and that's a safe way to test it they got they have evidence oh we have kinks in our system we have to work out these kinks how do they know that they were able to do a thing and then observe a thing to then do another thing Yeah, I have uh, teaching gigs that don't pay as well as others and are in smaller venues than others. Mm. And that's I, I, I follow that stand-up comedian uh, model very closely where it's like, okay, well, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not getting paid very well at all for this. There's only like five kids here. Time to experiment. Let's play with some different kinds of new teaching methods that I want to try in my you know, bigger arenas, right? <laughs> Is that disrespectful? I don't know. I don't think so. No, no, I was laughing because I want to see you do a comic class in an arena because I think it'd be magical. <laughs> uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> but you, you, you said something about like uh, there's, you know, self-direction is the primary value of the autodidact and that's something that they should be really aware of, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This This is about, it's not just about self-teaching, it's about directing yourself, which kind of is like a call to action. It is. And I think so part of that is you could be developing your own ability to self critique as a way to, um, 
be be a, a, a you know a, a source of information, a source of evidence to to help guide your progress and what whatever your res or your progress, the amount of resources or whatever you need to evaluate on what you're researching. Did you research enough? And are you able to produce the results you need to produce based on what you researched? Yeah, I think I think it's possible to learn how to critique yourself. I think it's it's entirely conceivable that you can learn the skills to look back at your work the next day or the day after and and oh gosh, that was also on another Thunder Punch Daily as I was talking about how my classes, like the the objective or rather the the teaching style uh and the lesson plan changes based on feedback I get from the kids. And then I ask myself, okay, when the kids unplugged from what I was doing, what, what do I think happened here? Let's, let's come up with a hypothesis of what exactly happened where the kids lost interest in what was happening and how, what, how can I address that to better serve them next time? So. Yeah, exactly. Like do it's almost, um, sometimes I think about it as learning a new language you really are building some kind of uh, familiarity to have a vocabulary to then form more complex concepts regarding the skill. Okay. So you teach, you, you learn how to self critique, uh, mm -hmm. any other ways to, you know, uh, any other inflections of this whole self direction that you wanted to cover before we move on? I um, tried to not do it totally alone. Honestly, the giant, I, I think the giant, uh, I don't know, elephant in the room about the whole concept of uh, self-taught is that I honestly don't think it exists because all of us who do um, some, some path of self-directed learning, we've benefited from all these creative efforts of others and likely have relationships with others who are willing to, you know, sometimes maybe provide expert review and, uh, provide uh be have informal teaching relationships um many years ago i learned the how to program in c and because i traded guitar lessons with with a friend <laughs> but i Rob, think i got I'm, the better I'm, deal <laughs> <laughs> uh but I'm, I'm a misanthrope rob that's why i became a visual storyteller because i just want to hole up my studio and not have to talk to anybody anymore because ugh, people boo whatever <laughs> as long as your shelter is made of gold or you're sitting on a pile of cash perfect because yeah then you you're this you're this you're the perpet uh the perpetuating missing throat machine i'm gonna stay here in my unibomber style shack <laughs> yeah that's uh that works if, if you can sustain it otherwise you're kind of screwed you're gonna have to engage in trade at some point and you know those darn people um <laughs> those darn people oh yeah. I'm nuts I gotta go trade with humanity again can we talk about yeah. the Dunning-Kruger effect because I only recently got introduced to this oh, by Zach Gilongo yes. on that comics are great episode that I mentioned a moment ago 100, episode 106 um, some, correct me if I'm wrong here but the, the, the gist of the Dunning-Kruger effect is it's, it's the situation where somebody comes along and they have no context and no, uh, they're completely ignorant of the amount of skill required to do a thing well. And, and to quote Zach, ignorant with like a small eye, you know, not passing judgment, not pejorative term, but like meaning they have no prior knowledge of what it takes to do this thing. And then they're like, well, how hard can it be? And then they just take a stab at it and then they hold it up and like, look how great I am at this thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And again, without passing judgment, it's, the, it's just, it's this, it's this uh, cognitive bias that, sounds nightmarish <laughs> to, wow. to be to be the to have that cognitive bias of thinking your stuff is way way better than it is and thinking that your skill level is way way higher than it is um and again without talking about it in any kind of judgmental way it's like how do we prevent having the dunning-kruger cognitive bias <laughs> and it goes yeah, back to how do we know if we're ignorant right yeah <laughs> uh this is uh this is where i point to the idea so i i like your misanthrope example because uh i think you're at a greater risk if that's if that is your inclination to be a misanthrope because one of the benefits of being a social creature is uh 
all the inherent feedback that you do receive by socializing is, and especially when you're when you're trying to engage in trade as you're so, socializing and trying to find um you know that that sort of you know mutual connection from the group that you want to provide service to and the reason that you're trying to learn a thing and and improve to help you know whoever all that stuff helps um provide some kind of uh waypoints as you know goals to set when you're learning a thing and also you know something to target and help frame up what you're trying to learn and then also um acknowledgement if you have learned it or not because that's uh you know one way to to know if you're you know are, are you a professional il illustrator is, is did someone pay you and and all that and so like there you go like so the the feedback helps avoid the dunning kruger effect which is yeah, honestly it's completely nightmarish and i think it's like this it's a great fuel for um uh, being you know different kind of fear-based approaches for for doing it because it reminds me of the episode of buffy's buffy the vampire slayer when she um she she um i i cannot remember the full thing but essentially it was like she imagined herself as insane uh, and so yeah. she didn't have the powers she didn't and and like her mom and dad weren't divorced and all this stuff it was crazy right and it was yeah. like i hate you joss <laughs> for making this episode because <laughs> obviously the high empathy whatever i mean she was she was you know um that that kind of effect happens when you just have such a distorted sense of what you're offering and where you're at with it and all that I know it's hard to say, like, I don't know how to talk about it without being a bit judgmental because th like, I honestly think so. Like at, you staged it really well at the third stage is where things sound like they went pretty wrong. And hopefully that you have some social environment that can help, you know, guide you back from, you know, assuming you're totally ready to rock the arena when you, you can't even hold a power cord. Right. 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 Well, it's just, it, yeah, it, it's just it's one of those, it's one of those things that once I read about it, it, it triggered an irrational fear in me of like, oh my god, uh, what if I actually <laughs> felt that way? Like, what if I'm what if I'm throwing down on paper is absolute garbage and I have no idea, you know? Uh, that it, again, it's irrational. It's just one of those things that comes with being a creative person where you you are vulnerable about that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but I also think that that fear is a good thing, as you pointed out, because it. It gives me an incentive to to look for evidence that I don't have this cognitive bias. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, it reminds me a lot the way you described it too of the whole like imposter syndrome thing, which I've not really studied, but you hear it the concept talked about casually, right? Where, mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm I've. I'm somehow being recognized to a greater extent than I was before. It's super unfamiliar. Everyone's going to find out I'm a, I'm a fake, right? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, it seems really pretty similar, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think it is probably related in some way. So, okay, for further right. reading on um, cognitive biases... Uh, you, you've you've talked about this book a lot before. This predict pr predictably irrational book. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's a really fun way to to essentially. I mean, re re reading the book, or actually, I've listened to the audiobook a few times. It's um, um, in a way, it's like uh, hearing hearing the kind of the the studies that that are described you almost are playing a game show as you're thinking like and guessing like how is that going to turn out and what's and why did it turn out that way and it's really fun to to essentially be exercising and thinking about these kinds of um biases and like why do we why do we make bad decisions and that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, so in a way it's just a you know it's just a mental workout mental fitness thing and then um, you also mentioned a podcast that I've not heard of before, the You Are You Are Not So Smart podcast. What's that? <laughs> it's, uh, I believe the gentleman is a, a professor in psychology, he's, he's, and he's written some really fun books. He's got a great radio voice, and I think it's on the Boing Boing podcast network. Okay. And um, he's written a book, too, um, that actually he's written two books, and I bought the second book that I haven't listened to yet on uh, from from Audible, right? And the second book is is called uh, "You Are Now Less Dumb." 
<laughs> so, I mean, he has a funny way of phrasing this and whatnot. And the podcast is just a ton of fun. Um, he's got a few different kind of episode formats in a way where um, every one of them is, uh, it's a good exercise in just in looking at the same kinds of topics that um, predictably irrational looks at. Why do we, um, why do we make bad choices? How can we make better choices? All that. And uh, it's just, uh, yeah, highly recommend it. And the recent one, um, gosh, what was the effect called? It's the uh, sunk cost fallacy. So, excellent one. Which is which is the the fallacy where you say uh, you're you're walking through the desert, and you've been walking for three weeks, and it doesn't seem like there's any water coming up ahead. But you go, well, I've walked this far, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, and the whole idea of. Um, yeah, you, you've you've done or made or used a thing for for um, for whatever reason, and new information comes to light. And your reason for not using that new information is because of this this past thing that somehow would become invalidated. And people will do a lot to avoid the sense of loss, and that's one thing you do get a very good flavor for. And start it's fun to start to examine and see where you're doing that kind of thing by by listening to these kinds of books or reading them. As I hear some people do. <laughs> no, I've 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 been victim to that myself. Uh, I have, I have a very distinct memory of having a discussion with friends who were trying to turn me on to using ink brushes, and I inked exclusively with a crow quill, and I uh, evoked the words of William Shatner and said, "I need my pain. Don't take this away from me." You know, uh, like as if as mm. if somehow learning the brush would like take away all those years of practicing the crow quill when really what it was, was about was me afraid to take on a new challenge right well and it's it's certainly a point that could be argued right and so it's worth at least arguing that and and exploring it the reason then... i shouldn't the reason for me to not do it was that i wasn't interested or that you know, I, I did try it and I didn't like it. There was something visceral that I did not enjoy about that experience. That's reason. But mm -hmm. to not know and to have people who are in my you know, artists in my life say, no, it's really great. You should give it a shot. And me to go, no, no, how dare you, <laughs> you know, uh, without any uh, reasoning behind it. That That's a bad reason. Mm -hmm. um, I want to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, do, do you want to talk about like characterizing the cycle of curating knowledge because you have talked about this in some past the entire episodes you talked about um when you're starting to research something you just like let you open the floodgates of your bookmarks how many bookmarks did you used to have in chrome in the old oh, days? i i killed um no this was uh firefox oh, firefox and um i it was weird i ended up using firefox as like my mini internet and uh <laughs> It was over 20,000. I think it was about 25,000 bookmarks. Wow. Yeah. And, so you would, um, you would just like, when you want to research a topic, you said, you, the words you've used that I remember were you like, you just let the information pour over you. You let it wash over you and you trust your brain to identify the things that are going to stick out and are, give you a signal for further research. Is that characterizing it properly? Yeah, it is. Um, because it's it's my understanding that uh boy so here i'm this is i'm only one source by all means do not listen to me only as one source on this but what i uh, a, a, ages ago when i started um before just before i started uh, uh my that you know game development company that really started off a, a whole different you know chapter in my life and my whole career um is uh I had heard something about how babies learn language, right? And they they do it with this, where with some of the just just this um, raw ability to start associating and creating patterns because of what they're processing over time, what they're associating them with, and eventually it becomes enough a rich enough of a pattern or a more reinforced and like a neural network, like a reinforced enough pattern where signal comes out of the noise, right? And so this is the most extreme form of it is when I was, well, I was super ignorant when I first started um, working uh, to try to learn how uh, game design and game development worked and software development and all that. And it was, uh, it was even before I traded the guitar lessons for C lessons and whatnot, right? And I was reading things that I didn't understand. 
but I kept reading them and I would reread them and then I would reread them and reread them. And then eventually I thought I'd have a thought and I would ask someone about that thing where I thought, I almost think I understand a thing. Let's see if I understand a thing. And it slowly built up from there, right? So I called that immersive learning. I don't know if that's a thing. I don't know if what, you know, but that's what I did. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, down the road, I eventually said, I want to embrace that again. And like, like that's what, what I have in my head. Even if I am familiar with something, it just helps the process move a little quicker where I do, um, out of, uh, I try to break out of my information bubble and consume a bunch of sources that are recommended from a bunch of sources. So hopefully I'm, I'm getting different perspectives and different biases, not all one bias that has filtered things down. And that's what I start to use to, so I'll read a lot on a, on a topic. And that's, that's, that's what that looks like is essentially gathering things to read from a bunch of sources and then reading them. That's. And then you're just trusting it. yourself to know what to capture and when. Yeah. And I mean, one way to, to look at that is, is if I don't feel like I'm becoming better informed or ready to do something on a topic, like for instance, I'll, I'll come, I'll try, I'll give a concrete example. I consulted for, I think about 18 months in the crop insurance industry a few years back, right? I didn't know a dang thing about <laughs> <laughs> insurance. And I mean, yeah, insurance is somewhat related to the finance industry. And yeah, I, I was, I, I, I did that for a good, you know, whatever, nine years or so. And, um, but I was trying to, you know, make choices about how do I advocate for, a, um, you know, an efficient flow of tasks and, and appropriate context and, and what, what information needs to be presented when, what actions need to present, be presented when. I can't look at this with my biases and make anything uh, close to a good decision. So time to swim in this stuff that I don't understand yet. And, you know, until I can start to, um, start to connect, uh, connect those concepts. So I shoot, was that useful at all? Yes. Yes, it was. Okay. And so that leads me to like the next thing that I wanted to explore about this is like when you just, you, you talk about different stages, like the hunter gatherer stage. I forget the four stages that you put together or that you were quoting from somebody else. I don't remember where it came from. Oh, I have, um, yeah. The, so this is the, i uh, I'm a, Honestly, I, I think an incredibly intelligent pattern for learning and ref, and and uh, and creating something is the creative process, right? And how we we make things that are, um, you know, shaped by a variety of of matters. I mean, both what we know, um, our the constraints of the mediums that we're choosing, who we're trying to be of use with them, and whatnot. So there's a natural progression if you just make a thing and then get feedback and refine. But then I heard this model. I think I heard it from Merlin Mann on the Back to Work podcast a few years ago. Um, he mentioned a book called um, A Whack on the Side of the Head. And and I have, um, it's so funny. Like I have read that, like chunks of that book, but it's nuts because it's such an interesting book of different chunks of information about the process that, it's been more of a reference for me, but, um, but I have the Kindle version and, and I, I like to look at it from time to time and how it frames up the creative process for me became such a, um, a, a great way to frame up, um, excuse me, like how I, uh, learn and make stuff where it, uh, it characterized the process at, at where they're like habits, but imagine them as roles where, uh, one role you have the, um, let's see, you have the explorer or the hunter, right? Who's finding concepts and things and starting to gather the raw material. But then the next stage or role, right? And it's not linear either, but like, let's, let's just call it the next stage. You have the artist who is now refining and applying their uh, sense of aesthetics and purpose and all that to shape the thing. Then next stage, you have the judge who is like, that thing's awesome. That thing's crap. This thing's, you know, this needs tweaking and yeah. you know, all that. 
where, because again, like where you can be your own editor or your own critic or what have you. And then the next stage is um, the, the warrior. And the warrior is, you know, needs to go to battle. You got to ship. You got to get that thing out. And the warrior helps move stuff along with that sense of urgency. And what I realized is that at different stages, I would special at different stages of my, you know, career or whatnot, I would way overemphasize one of those things, but not all of them. So that what I'm trying to do now is just use them all and and not get stuck on the judge, typically. <laughs> Yeah, the judge is what prevented you from shipping those polytechnic casts. That you oh, so many polytechnic casts, the judge's like, nope, send it back. <laughs> this one sucks. Don't do it. Oh, well, that 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 judge, he's like the Supreme Court of of my tweeting. Uh, so many race tweets. Jeez. So many so many moments where uh, I said like, oh, I gotta say this, and then nah, yeah. Um, all right, so question. When you're doing these different uh, parts of the research, and really you're talking about explorer hunters being like most of your research, but then like when artists gets a control of it and starts looking at it, um, for me, I've found that my goals, this is like either when I start setting new goals or I recalibrate my original goals in the research. Like I thought I wanted to learn this. But once I started molding it and understanding it a little bit more deeply, it's like, oh, what I really wanted to learn was that. Is it the same way for you? Do you find that like the, the, the goal setting changes? And if that's the case, then how important is goal setting at the outset? Hmm. Well, I think it's, it's inherent. Uh, the phrase I like to use is I don't want to punish learning. And... <laughs> so if uh if i really have picked up a new thing that i that is helping me adapt and get better at solving this i'm i i like to go with it uh because i uh, to me that's the maybe that's my antidote to the um sunk cost fallacy to be like well i've done this i've i've, I've come so far on this one path and yeah, that one part isn't the right thing, but I'm just going to push on anyway or whatever. And uh, and sometimes, actually, that's that that's a really effective choice, but I like to at least make sure I'm not... Um, but that I'm making a, that tr choice as, in, as, as informed as I can be. So it's... Yeah. Yeah, so I'll totally go back and refine... Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm a fan of it, actually, so... Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm a fan of changing gears when... I feel like I've come to the end of a road or in exploring it, it's like, oh, I started learning it this way because I thought that's the way you, that, that I needed to do it. And then upon looking into it more deeply, I found out that it was a much more efficient or more interesting way over there. Time to drop this. Boom, dropping it, running over there now to explore it from that angle. Uh, and so I, and I, what, does, what does that look like and how does it feel? Uh, it looks like me saying... I've I've explored this thing. I feel that I understand it pretty deeply. I've found its limits. Uh, I can live with its limits, but in finding its limits, I found a more efficient, uh, an, another more efficient way to do it over yonder. I feel a little bad abandoning this method. Right? Uh, there's like a little bit of sunk cost fallacy of like, well, I hope this wasn't a waste. Uh, but then, you know, I tell myself that it's not a waste because it led me to over there to this better way of doing it. And uh, sometimes that means that I have to, and it depends on the kind of work I'm doing, but it means that, like, maybe I got to go back and, like, rejigger old, like, I'm thinking about comics always. I'm always thinking about mm -hmm. comics, Rob. But I might have to rejigger the way I did some original pages. Like, I like I did the five pages this way. And then by the time I got to page six, I found this much more efficient way of doing this thing. Well, now I got to kind of go back and fix pages one through five. Um, but... The benefit is is that, oh my gosh, pages six and on are going to happen so much easier or so much faster or so much more interestingly, right? Um, mm. Yes, sunk cost fallacy, but also um, new horizon fallacy, right? Uh, I get to look forward to a new, uh, exciting new time. <laughs> or the, yeah, um, consultants always know best, whoever says the new, newest thing or whatever. Um, it's... <laughs> 
Uh, no, that that is interesting, and that that is hard. Honestly, that that it looks. I think it it's not it, a um to just you know do the this topic proper respect is that that transition isn't something that is just um nothing and no big deal typically no it, it it's not and there is a real palpable sense sometimes of oh i just wasted my time I just well wasted and, and or the evidence you're leaving behind too like i did do it this way and it, and when you're making visual art like it looks it can look different yes yes and then and, and then they say well don't look at my old stuff you know uh, that that that's something that I, I i i like to think i've gotten over uh in the last five ten years um a because it's natural that your, your stuff should be getting better because if, if if i could tell you go look at the stuff i did 20 years ago and i'm just as proud of the stuff i'm doing now like i think it's just as good as the stuff i'm doing now then what the heck have i been doing for the past 20 years it should be getting better all the time it should be improving in some 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 way that is vi that is visible um and okay if that's the case then shouldn't i be proud of the stuff that i did 20 years ago you know, shouldn't I be proud of that too for what it was, for who I was at the time? The same the same reason why I get like really angry at people who, um, and I do get angry about this, when people are like, uh, oh, that kid's show was so dumb, and I was dumb for loving mm -hmm. it. Oh, so in other words, kids are dumb for loving kids' stuff. You know, you, you get the stink eye from me if you, if you say that in front of me. <laughs> I would love to know what the heck that bias is precisely. Then th this is the thing, like those biases... If you go shopping, you go to Wikipedia, and you're like, "Oh, I'm going to examine these things, whatever." They're not, you know, exact and you know, simple puzzle pieces or whatever. But like, there that that totally is a thing where, um, where I'm at, it it's it's somehow I recognize that it's better, and so where I'm from and anyone else who's not where I'm at sucks. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it it certainly. Yeah, it certainly is a thing. And I know it's, that it, it, I feel like I used to do that, and hopefully I'm, maybe I'm just mellow. Oh, no, and when I was a young man, I did it too. Uh, and and I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a natural thing to do when you're first starting out, and I think, I think it's, in, my guess is that there's, there's, there's some scarcity built into that. I got the thing. I got the thing that only a few of us get to have, and mm. fooey on all of you losers who didn't come <laughs> in in time, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> that's I. I don't know. That's funny. That's a uh, that's a knowledge villain. <laughs> that's All right, a knowledge based How, villain. All right. So as as somebody <laughs> knowledge based villain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, those guys and gals. Yeah. Um, self autodidact. I'm gonna yeah. get on the ground in a minute, but I want I want to mm -hmm. I want to talk about this. Like, how do you? Uh, verify the quality of the research or the, the content that you're researching. How do you tell? Because man, I can do a Google search. Uh, here, here's an example, and this has come up a lot in the talks that Dan Mishkin and I have been doing for the Warren Commission report. Um, there's autopsy photos in the book that I had to recreate, um, and Dan, God bless him, was very careful about which ones he selected for me, <laughs> so I didn't have to, uh, you know, do anything terribly, terribly gory, but. Uh, at one point, I did a, a, an image search for JFK autopsy photos, and I've joked around about it a lot. Like, please don't ever, ever do that. I even had safe search on, and it was awful. Um, but the photos of the autopsy have never been released, so all of those are fake, right? Yeah, and I wouldn't have known that had I not worked on this book. So the, the photos that I used as the basis for the panels that I drew in the book were actually uh, illustrations based on the photos that have not been released to the public. So mine are drawings of a drawing of a photo. Um, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, how would I know? How would I know unless I was working on this book, right? I, um, so how do you know when you do a Google search on something that, the, that yeah. the, the information is quality? It's... um. It's not straightforward. I mean, so let's see. So uh, how did you discover that? Uh, Dan. Dan. Through Dan's research. I mean, because... How he, did Dan he, discover he, that? Uh, it was in one of the books that he read written by somebody who was involved in the entire event. I forget which person. Ah. Uh, but it was it was somebody who was it, was... it was it was a government official who was involved in the assemblage of the Warren Commission report. Um, there you go. 
Right. So what I just did, I, I just asked about the, the lineage of that information, right? Uh, provenance. Where did it come from? Where did that come from? And then, et cetera. And this is a dangerous thing. Yet, um, you know, yeah, we get, we get inf- sources of information that we do build up a lot of trust. Encyclopedias were certainly one uh, back in the day. And then here we go. Wikipedia has taken that over. And mm, Wikipedia is governed by methods that overall make it pretty darn good and a, a very attractive source. And there, there, there are, oh gosh, the book um, that I always forget the title because it's so, uh, here comes everybody. Wow. Uh, there we go. Like Shirky? Yeah. Um, it, it, I think that but that's the book that goes into good detail about how the Wikipedia project worked and grew out of uh, being a paid encyclopedia and then eventually, you know, free and how the, the how that, how essentially, how could that free resource be trustworthy, et cetera. So um, it's, uh, it's good to question the sources and whatnot. Uh, so when, when Dan told you that, he had found it was, um, I don't know, like, did it seem completely out of the realm of possibility that they were fake when he shared that news? Or did it? What do you mean? The photos I don't know, like, I found? what I'm, I'm curious is like, it's, well, I'll just say it straight up, uh, uh, having a, uh, some healthy skepticism, I think yeah. is, uh, you know, so, so what is skepticism? It's, um, it's more or less, uh, the habit of scientific method. I mean, that's maybe an oversimplification, but uh, it's different than cynicism. It's very different than cynicism. But some people have trouble dis- uh, discerning between the two things, right? Sure. Skepticism, skepticism is I don't take anything at face value. I'm, I've got to verify this. There's many a vocal acerbic skeptic, right? Yes. And I think they have good reason to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly can be tough to relate to. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, but then in certain skill leveling up, like let's say I, I go to, and I don't know if you've ever seen the way Eric Larson holds a pen. He's a comic book artist working on the amazing Spider-Man, Savage Dragon, created Savage Dragon. One of, one of the primary influences on the, the way I approach drawing. Uh, he, he is legendary for holding his pen in a really weird way. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd, I'd have to look up a photo, but I saw him drawing at a Comic Con, and it was something like this. He was drawing like this. <gasps> That's with right. Yep. I remember uh, seeing a picture at some point. Yep. Now let's suppose it's a sort Eric of Larson, overhand grip. Let's suppose Eric Larson did a, a, a tutorial on how to ink comics, and he said, "Well, this is the way you hold your pen. You got to do it like this. This is the way I do it. After all, be like me. I'm the guru. And let's say I'm just starting out." Right? And I go, okay, well, that's the way you hold the pen after all. Um, how do I know whether or not this is good information? Well, what sort of observations can you make about that? Right. So if you think about a traditional way to hold a pen, what sort of effects does it have on the act of drawing? When you, If you hold a pen in the way that Eric Larson holds a pen, what sort of effects does it have on the drawing? And Or my rough... So I have a hypothesis that maybe he it allows him of se- a sense of visibility, of um, unencumbered visibility. That's my guess, because huh. I like just when you hold your hand like that, it's almost like you've dropped a pen out of the sky, and it's like out, <laughs> out of the way. I should say for um, those who are just listening to the audio, what we're talking about is he holds the pen, like hold your pen in your hand like you would a fork or a knife, and then turn the pointy part down towards the paper holding the, mm. the, the pen that way and then draw, right? Mm-hmm. Um, very strange way of drawing. And I mean, like I look at him, he's getting results, right? And then I'm doing it, I'm, I, I may get results or I may not get results, right? So like, is it working? Certain things, like the way you verify it's, it's, it's useful, is usefulness or, or, or whether it's quality is whether or not it actually applies to your situation or applies to your approach or skill set, right? Absolutely, yeah. What, uh, so how, how do you go about noticing that? How do I go about noticing what? Yeah. Well, if it's, uh, oh, is this, if it's working or not. Yeah. Is this thing, is this thing working or, or not? Um, well, I mean, I guess that's where I've, I, I guess I do have a, a reasonable amount of self critique skill. 
Um, because the example I always go back to is how I learned the brush pen just by doing these 20 minute warm up sketches. And then once I had amassed a certain amount, I spread them out on a table and I looked at them to see if the quality was changing in any way. Because day to day, you're not going to notice as much. Uh, I noticed, you know, I was making observations. Uh, see, maybe this is where we're bad examples, Rob, because we do a lot of self reflection. But um, I was doing daily observations of is it getting easier? Am I finding new ways to use this thing? Oh, if I pull the brush this way, it does that. I didn't know that before. Wow, new thing. Um, but then also, you know, laying out the, the, the sketches after you know, a couple weeks and seeing if there was any marked change in them. And I, I noticed it. Therefore, okay, I'm learning something here. This tool is working for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it feels like I'm fighting with it less, and the results I'm getting are very interesting to me. Um, I've had other tools that I put down and never picked up again because no marked improvement, uh, not very pleasant experience. Uh, I found I found myself fighting with it, you know, like it's like why can't I get it to do this thing that I want to do? Well, maybe this isn't the tool for what I want to do, right? So those are uh, very handy evaluation tools. What we, what you just listed out. So you had uh, a method method of evaluating based on observations, based on um, data you produced, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, and, and you, you hit it from a few different angles, which there you go. So hopefully you have enough clarity to, to say that, well, that's, uh, I feel, I feel uh, totally informed to, to make this call and you make it and just keep on moving. Yeah. So. Of course, it always helps to have, you know, people you trust whose taste you trust. I should say that. There are people I trust whose taste I do not trust. <laughs> 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 then there are people whose taste I have, like, nothing but the most implicit, unquestioning trust. Um, where if they say, eh, make that 10% cuter, I'm going to do that because they know what they're talking about kind of thing, right? Hmm. Um, it helps to have somebody like that in your life and... Uh, I think finding them is, it's hard, but it's easier than you think. And it starts with you sharing things, <laughs> you know, you know, like, can I, can I do a plug for art sound off challenge? Cause that's one of the things that I'm finding is happening is I'm watching some of the different leaners interact with one another through this thing and talking with mm -hmm. one another online, which is super, super, super exciting to me. So yeah. Anyway, art sound off.com. Rob, do you want to get on the ground? Cause we are uh, looking at like, half hour left on the clock yeah well i mean honestly I'm, I'm feeling really good with what we've covered so far and uh this is uh i think that it's very you know in tune with the nature of the topic um i do want to mention too like there's it, so one of the things you're describing is, that I, I thought we covered really well like at the beginning of this year i believe when in an episode of uh the lean into our cast with um brandon dayton and um dave roman dave roman yeah, because yeah, we talked about essentially uh, critique and, and art buddies and such. Uh, critique is a two-way street. As, the thing is, as you're developing those muscles in, in evaluating like what you're learning and your skill and all that, um, that is something that is just, just highly sought after. And when you have conversations in, in the thoughtful manner with other, other artists you're connecting with, uh, that's there you go like it's those very skills that i think are, are incredibly helpful to connect yep i agree and i will link to that in the show notes that's a great episode the one that with uh dave dave roman and brandon dayton talking about mm -hmm. critiquing and art buddies fantastic episode one of my favorites so if you haven't listened to it or if you haven't listened to it in a long time go back and listen to it it's so good um okay with that rob do you want to kick off the next section <laughs> sure <laughs> Um, Rob got a soundboard, everybody. <laughs> I totally got a soundboard. So exciting. Um, on the fun. ground. Okay, we discussed all this stuff in abstract for, for quite a, a substantial amount of time. I think we covered it very thoroughly and as thoughtfully as we could. Now, how to put this stuff into action. So you want to conduct research. You want to start leveling up your skills. You want to start collecting inspiration, hoarding, that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to share some of the methods that we use, and if you have your own special technique that you want to share with us, you can always email us at leanintoart at gmail.com. So let's kick off with your tools first, Rob. 
Um, my tools are, um, I guess I nicknamed them, uh, I, I put them in this conceptual shed I call my info stream, which I open it up and there's a, like, just this wonderful underwater river of, of information that, that I carved. And I didn't fill it, but like I carved it. And I, 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 I fed it with um, uh, sources that uh, I... It's so fu it's so funny. I'm I'm being all hand wavy. Basically, I, I listened to um to, to a, a few different things that I sampled out of going back and forth between the habit of gathering stuff and consuming the stuff, and then some of the stuff is like I'll um it'll be a pretty long long haul if I when you know, when I get to it like when, like things like bookmarks and when I capture articles and whatnot in Evernote. So like I will use the service uh pinboard.in to um to capture bookmarks frequently, right? I will capture articles occasionally when when it's like um and I and I capture that using the um the sort of the optimized reader view in Evernote using the the Evernote web browser plugin. And I do that when I want to have I'm like this is super cool to know and either I like really I read it and I think this is awesome or I read enough where I'm like I I want this to be part of my brain in the sky you know which is how I think of Evernote and that's kind of like a just an ongoing habit thing where occasionally things like a podcast will pop up and I'm like hmm how is this thing I will, I'll sample it I'm like mm -hmm, is this oh, nope you it's bitter nope spit it send it back um and then, uh, but sometimes I'm like, Ooh, this one was delicious. I'm going to, you know, totally hunt here again. And, uh, I will, uh, then I'll put, I'll add that to my feed and just consume it on a, you know, fairly regular basis, you know, via commuting and chores. Um, but then, uh, other places where I'm doing this capture and there's, there's kind of different nuanced kinds of capture. Yep. You have a question, Jersey? No, no, I'm, okay. I'm pulling up no. links while you talk about them. It's, um, the, uh, um, well, I will, um, I journal in, <laughs> not publicly and whatnot, because the judge swats that down left and right. Um, but I, but I capture journals in this app called Day One. And, uh, it's, uh, very, uh, Apple ecosystem centric. Yet, I think overall, it doesn't do anything too much crazy or different than if you had like a private WordPress blog. And in a nutshell, it's just an app that behaves like a blog. So it has a, a few fancier UI isms and stuff. But uh, what I have is, is just, you know, what you would expect from a private blog. And that's a place where I will capture like emotions and observations and philosophical things and stuff that I probably totally should be publish publishing, but you know, working on negotiating with the judge. Um, but, uh, but anyway, but it's there. So I'm glad that I'm glad to be capturing and not losing it. Um, then I also will use my note cards, which I carry in my little, uh, Oxford wallet for urgent capture. That's the stuff where between whatever's in my hand or closer at hand, I either use the note card or, um, my iPhone and I use the app, uh, drafts. And so one or the other is get, gets these urgent um, capture things. And then, to be honest, um, I did pick up uh, something that really helps my workflow with the with the note cards recently. And it's the um, I feel completely spoiled. It's the uh, Fu uh, Fujits Fujitsu ScanSnap iX500. That sucker scans stacks of note cards like it was born to scan stacks of note cards. Like nothing, like it's <laughs> awesome. It's just brrr, chews through what, them. What 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 is this thing called again? It's a scanner, and it's called the uh, Fujitsu ScanSnap iX500. And um, it's a, uh, I'm a, it's a pretty impressive device. I mean, it doesn't do large format things. It can do up to eight eight and a half by eleven, or I think that's roughly A4 format. Oh, so this is a flatbed? Nope. It's uh, um it's funny. It's um it looks like a looks like a um an inedible loaf of bread or so. Okay. Okay. Um so it's one of those where you feed in the card like this. Yep. You feed in the card 
and, like, like from um, top, and it like, has like, like a an, piece of toast. Exactly, an adjustable um, catcher that uh-huh. can catch up to like an eight and a half by eleven in portrait mode. So, okay. and then what does it do with that after the fact? Uh, it's it will uh, alert the app on your machine that then says what you know based on like what do you want me to do with this? Often, what I do is it goes to Evernote if it's purely visual. Uh, uh, visual art, you know, ink lines, what have you. I will, I will scan it to my images folder, and that gets all synced up and backed up and all that. But then, if it's um, informational and you know, very urgent capture ish, it goes into Evernote. And Evernote has OCR technology, so it can recognize yep. the, the the words in your sketch cards to make them searchable. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's got, it can, we can recognize text. It can recognize handwriting. It's um, pretty awesome. Oh, man. So that is tempting. The Fujitsu, Fujitsu uh, Snap 1X. I could, I fought myself on this darn purchase for like a year and a half. And then they eventually upgraded it, and I still fought myself on it for a year and a half. And then I, because it seems so silly, I'm like, oh, just shut up, Rob. Get out your camera. And your little silly stand, and snap these photos of the, and I'm like, eventually I, I gave in, and I'm super glad I did. <laughs> no, and I, I'll tell you why I I can imagine that this thing would be useful um, as opposed to because everybody would be saying like, well, you got a camera in your pocket with your phone. I keep track of my receipts for my personal business, right? So if I'm uh, traveling, my travel expenses, dinners, you know, art supplies, materials for my business. And um, there's a bunch of great apps on the phone to capture and, and organize all of your receipts so that you can like file a report at the end of the year. So when I do my taxes, I've got a clear statement of what I spent money on for different categories of business, business expenses, right? Mm-hmm. What apps are those? What, um, Expensify is the one I've been using. Uh, the one I like the most. Have you heard cool. of that one? It's iOS nope. and Android. Oh, cool. Um, so I got this phone. Is that the Expensify on it? I fill up. I, I'm I'm doing uh, a road trip for a teaching event or something, and I fill up my tank of gas. So this is gas for a business expense. So I get the receipt from the gas uh, thing. I get in the car. I could just snap the photo right then and there. I don't always think of it. I put the receipt in my wallet. Next thing I know, I've got 30 receipts in my wallet. And then I have a whole afternoon of trying to snap photos, entering in the information for each and every darn receipt. And I'm, I'm kicking myself for not doing that, right? So it's like having the scanner it seems like it'd be the solution for when I don't take the picture of the cards when they pile up. And it's like, I just need to scan these really fast and have them all go to a certain place. It it doesn't sound that extravagant to me, Rob. It sounds like it's actually a pretty handy thing to have. Uh, compared to comp- competitive uh, competing uh, scanners, it's pricey. So okay. that's all. So that's that's what led to the a lot of hemming and hawing about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I exactly it's that you know for me I have I I do I make stacks and stacks of doodles and notes on index cards. <laughs> And and then the prospect of like some of them, I, I rim like, wow, I really want to put that into Evernote. You know, you know uh, anyway, it, and just some some fun quotes and, and thoughts and whatnot from like um, any episode of, of Lean Into Art or whatnot. And some of them are, are they're so down thick. I'm like, uh, nope, can't do it. Goes into the box. <laughs> so anyway, and so that's a lost, you know, I don't know. As long as, um, like, obviously, with all this capture, with it's it's pointless if you're not reviewing it at some point. Yeah, and that's that's where I think I'm falling short. Um, because I and I, I chronicled this on the Thunder Punch Daily as well. Is that in in my lead up doing my little bit of research for this episode, I was going through my habits of capture, and I realized that I capture in a lot of different places, and I don't have a clear method on curating it and collecting it and refining that capture. So like I've got a weekly ritual where I go to, this is where we get some of my tools. Um, I go to, I go, I go to Pinterest once a week and it's like, just like a dedicated time I set to just do, um, inspiration hoarding. Let's plow through uh, Pinterest and just like 
you know, do searches for character design, um, medieval armor, uh, you know, salads, sandwiches, whatever I happen to be interested in that day. And I'm just looking at art by other people and grabbing them all into these private boards. And I've got private boards for like character design, uh, poses, you know, like if you're looking for really cool action poses, do a search for parkour on uh, Pinterest. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, you can get some really, I mean, like, I, I did a search for martial arts, and it was a lot of, like, posing, like, Tai Chi kind of posing. Like, here's a guy with his leg uh, up, kicked up high, and kind of doing this with his arms. Not what I'm looking for here, but I did a search for parkour, and it's all, suddenly it's, like, all these awesome leaping shots that I'm totally going to use in uh, the Boulder and Fleet story. Um, or use as reference for the Boulder and Fleet story. Uh, but, uh, so I've got these private boards that I keep for all this stuff, but then that's in one place. And then I'll go to Tumblr, and Tumblr's my next tool. Is like I keep a private Tumblr log, and like I follow a lot of artists. And when I see something that that really moves me, inspires me, or is interesting, or like, oh, that's got a great color palette, or as anybody seen on the Lean Into Art Tumblr uh, Tumblr log, uh, a lot of tutorials show up there. Like, oh yeah, here's a really great way. This is a great tutorial that breaks down how the muscles on the human back are arranged, and it's a great reminder to me of like how that's all arranged. Uh, and they, they just, like, simplify it all into, like, these wonderful shapes that make it easy for me to grok and remember. I'm tucking that away in there, right? So now I've got something in a private Tumblr. I've got something in private Pinterest boards. Uh, and then I've got Google Keep, which is, like, my urgent capture when I'm browsing the web. Like, somebody posts a link on Facebook or on Twitter, and I click, go, go to Chrome on my phone to look at the link. And I'm like, oh, this is a little long read, but it looks really interesting. I'm going to follow up on that later. Boom, goes into Google Keep. Where do I organize all these different things, right? Where is my canonical place? Um, so you're reminding me that uh, a review session is in order after you've done all that urgent capture. I need to, like, like as you put it in the notes, it's hygiene, right? Mm. <laughs> Going yeah. through and, like, combing through it, literally combing through it. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, I don't, what sounds, it's, I actually don't capture every note I write. I actually, uh, I mean, some, I even electronic or physical notes, I dispose of because it's been, it's, it, sometimes it, it's part of it's redundant or, um, yeah, for whatever reason, I'm like, nope, this, I don't, I don't need this one. And, uh, so yeah, so some of the hygiene is, is sort of culling during capture, but then other, other parts is just, um, refining it from a raw material into something more durable and that's where you could turn things into tasks or tag stuff not mm. go nuts with tagging but you know not that i want to talk but yeah but i mean everyone's pretty searchable though so i mean how much organization do you really have to do well what's uh for me i like to um consider if i like if i have a verb where it's almost like um like a mini, a mini task list in a way. It's like I, I flag a lot of things in Evernote by making up the or or using a keyword like review, right? Review, review, review. Like I'll just go through and like tag the things I think are pertinent to what I where I want to now go through and do a dive. It's like I'm I'm feeling I'm I'm making my own like a little mini info stream here, and I'm I'm about to 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 dive through it, and as I go I finish it, then I'm deleting that tag or deleting it and replacing it with another tag so i don't go back and reread it for that gotcha. purpose what about um you got here in the notes now we're on to like active research and organizing the information um yeah you say pinboard.in plus tagging plus ios app Explain so that. um i've got some, some i experiment during my bus commute and it's it's feel it's so still it's still new and weird to me and uh um it's like this time where i don't have to do i don't have <laughs> i'm just i can sit and it's a productive thing where i move from point a to point b where you know i get to my get to my work at the at point b and it's um uh it's nuts because I can I can read through tasks in, in OmniFocus or I can I can peruse Evernote or whatever, but I commonly will um go back through and do like these mini dives through like Pinboard because I do I mean, I am frequently um flagging uh what I think would, would could be helpful resources 
right? So like my pin board, my bookmarks aren't like, oh, guaranteed helpful resource. Some are, but then um, it's more like, ah, this looks, it's prospects. It's pro- I suppose it's, it's, it's the forecasting part. Like, you know, like I, I expect this area to be, you know, interesting and nourishing. I'm going to check that out and follow up. And so, yeah, I, I'll use the, um, the handy app, iOS app. Uh, doo, doo, doo. I, and, of course, it's not actually a pin board. I'm going to open my uh, phone. It's called Pushpin. That's the app I really like because Pushpin can deal with the amount of bookmarks I throw at it. <laughs> okay, so this isn't an official pinboard.in app. No, it's not. And that's a really good – glad you brought that up. Because the first thing I did while you were talking was I went to the Google Play Store to see if it, there was an Android version. Like, did they make one yet? Did they make one yet? No, they did not. But somebody else did, yeah. um, which, ending on what you're keeping in there, you know, I'm a little hinky about using third-party apps for certain things, right? Like, I would never, like, for me, I'd feel a little weird about using a third-party app for my Gmail or something. Yeah, certainly. And so pinboard.in is, 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 is a, it is a cloud service. So typically what, whatever app you're using, yeah, they might be siphoning information off or whatnot. I mean, hey, it's always good to check out who's making well, it. If it's it, a free app, it's good to be suspicious of it. And, and it depends on the information you're putting in there, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it, uh, some of these bookmarking things you might want to be putting like really, or, or even like a, like a note-taking app, you might be putting really sensitive information in there, like your tax records or your, your birth certificate, scanning your birth certificate or something like that, just to have a, like a digital backup of the thing and having knowing that, like, oh, it's safe, it's in the cloud then after all. I've got a backup of the thing. Um, yeah, but it depends on who's actually uh, providing that service. Right? That's a really good point. Like, for me, there's no way I'd use a third-party Evernote app. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, the ones that Evernote shares sure right yeah but yeah that's what i'm saying it's like like if, if google like if i'm going to use google services i'm not going to use a third-party client for google drive right i'm going to use the google right. version of google drive um it, just the whole idea of sharing my gmail login with any third-party service is freaky outy to me um so anyway but no i yeah it was a super good point and i was also thinking um in, in, as far as uh, to, to frame up, I mean, the, the things that we're listing here is like, well, why? It sounds like more like general, you know, workflow things. But no, it totally applies to research, too, where um, especially when I think about um, other tools that I use during active research um, where, yeah, even the, the, the bookmarks, it's about, you know, getting familiar and letting the information wash over me and whatnot. But then I actually will um, do some summarizing, too where I'm trying to start mapping out concepts. I'll do mind maps to just sort of like, here's where, in a way, like what, what this activity is, is it's, um, um, it's uh, secondary research, right? So you're using someone else's information and you're, you're creating your own understanding and whatnot of it, summarizing, uh, you know, creating, you know, helping other people, you're curating in a way. So you're, 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 and in that act, um, I find it ha- helpful to sort of, you know, s- quiz myself and see what I'm, I'm understanding by just generating a mind map or doing a modeling exercise where I'm, I just try to doodle out like, um, how does this fit in a timeline or a journey of someone using this thing I'm trying to research for? So for me, it's a lot, a lot, typically it's about producing a system to help, um, to help someone accomplish a task, right? And so, so you, all what that. do you use for mind mapping? Uh, well, mind mapping, um, all you need to do is use use any uh, anything from doodling, like just a bubble with a word in it, or a word, and then connect other words and with, with lines. But if uh, but digital apps, I really enjoy a few. Um, one I'm enjoying a lot lately is uh, I Thoughts X for OS X. And then there's I thoughts um, without, you know, the um, suffix for um, iOS. Um, Android, it's escaping me which one I was using there. But um, but more and more, this category is getting there's there's attention and there's life here, right? Um, uh, another app that I use too is a uh, Mind Node. 
But there's lots of web services services popping up where you can essentially save a mind map of some format to you like your Google Drive. And this app will just, you know, do its thing with a file that happens to be um, a mind map. And it's all it's all in the cloud, even the even the tool itself. I um, like this idea of visually summarizing what your knowledge of the thing is. And it's like it's a visual version of trying to explain the concept to a friend and looking for their questions to help you identify what you don't know. Totally. It's yeah, and that test of well, can I explain it? Can I explain it simply enough? Then I, maybe I maybe I am getting familiar with this. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Doodle Dex. Uh, that's that is like the visual um, narrative version, where essentially I will um, I've been working on uh, just practicing the whole like the sketch notes realm of techniques and trying to like make my own uh, feel in language with that where essentially um, sketch notes is I mean there's there's not like a brand for this it's just doodling right but there's a couple of really uh, influential awesome resources I think out there on this there's um, uh, Mike Mike Rohde's book um, he has a couple books I don't have a second one yet but the, the sketch notes workbook and then um, SUNY Brown's uh, doodle revolution they're both awesome on this topic where you're just capturing things conceptually. And so what I try to do is create, you know, human shapes and other shapes that just represent the iconic sort of concepts that tell that tell that same kind of story and associate things together, show people in a situation using a piece of technology and then use that to help uh, me share research. Uh, that's super cool. We should also link to the sketch note handbook as well. Uh, another great book on this subject. Um, I like this idea that you wrote in the notes too of uh, tweeting a pitch, like writing a tweet pitch for the thing, right? Uh, and this reminds me of something we talked about with Ryan Estrada, ryanestrada.com, uh, about, gosh, what, I don't remember what episode it was, and I'll have to look it up, but it was where we were talking about like writing 25 headlines like 25 drafts of a headline before you get yep. to the right one. And then you threw the challenge at him of, I want to do, and I think he just did this off the cuff, if I remember mm -hmm. right. You're just like, oh, I'm going to do a comic about uh, a family who opens up a restaurant inside of an Egyptian pyramid or something <laughs> like that, right? Am I, is that sound right? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and then Ryan sat down and he did 25 drafts of what to call that title uh, uh, ideas. And he hits number 25 and he comes up with a food pyramid. And I was like, dang it, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> but, like, this idea of trying to do, like, a whole bunch of, like, succinct drafts of your summary of the idea of the thing that you're trying to understand, right? Mm -hmm. And this goes back to proficiency or expertise in, in the Dreyfus model where it's, like, you can come up with maxims to summarize uh, uh, the knowledge of the thing that you're trying to communicate to somebody, right? Exactly, Yeah. So it's um if you're if you're producing that likely you are becoming um you you've become more familiar or engrossed in that topic and fluent so you're likely able to start now um uh being your research will likely serve you in whatever you're trying to tackle be it you know um uh, doing illustration in a book about the Kennedy assassination or um you know designing designing a system um of you know whatever sol solving some kind of solving some kind of problem or delighting people with whatever um a game you know and then just having some good rationale behind it and 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 the summary of your research that helps frame up what you're about to tackle that's a that's a good indicator and then the only other one i wanted to share was that um for me a signal when it's time to start organizing something into batches or start sorting through it and uh, uh, curating the knowledge is when I have a project. Uh, so like as soon as I have a specific project that this research is for, then a folder appears in my Google Drive, a folder appears on my desktop, and a folder appears in another cloud service. And then in, in some cases, a physical sketchbook appears for mm -hmm. that project. And this is where the the the... 
um, the stuff I'm gathering on Evernote, or I mean um, Pinterest, because I'll do I'll do like you know uh, reference research there. It's like okay, well Kennedy's limo was this particular kind of car. I'm gonna look up as many pictures of this particular kind of car as possible, and I'm gonna you know jam them all into into Pinterest because I don't have to worry about storage. And then I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna look for the best shots, the ones that match the shots that I'm trying to recreate. And those are getting downloaded. Those are getting put in a folder, and it's going to be backed up someplace else, right? So when it becomes project-based, when there's a specific project that I'm doing the research for, then I'll actually create physical folders. And like again, for the Boulder and Fleet thing, I have uh, a moleskin sketchbook where I'm. That's where all of my random ideas for the story are getting captured. And then I have um, a dummy of the book, which is just a uh, typing paper folded in half, stapled, it's like 40 pages with pre-ruled page templates on there. And if you follow me on Pinterest, or yeah, Pinterest, God, I keep mixing up things, Instagram, um, I posted one of the thumbnails that I had for the Boulder and Fleet comic, where it's like, this is like, those, those two sketchbooks are with me, they're on my person every day at all times in case, the, you know, I need to capture it in there. I'm not capturing any of that stuff digitally except to scan the thumbnails in so that I can build pencils off of them digitally. But um, all the capture is happening physically with that. Hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so it, it sounds like the um, and they're not separate sketchbooks, or are they? Yes. I have, I have a Moleskine sketchbook, which is just r like random doodle idea sketchbook. I should have mm -hmm. brought it down. Uh, when we were doing the show, but this is where I'm just like, oh, that would be a funny moment in the book. So I'm going to sketch out that two panel sequence, right? And it's, and it's not in any kind of order. It's relatively loosey goosey. Just, just, this is me brain barfing all of my Boulder and Fleet stuff into one place. And then the second one is just typing paper folded in half, stapled 40 pages or so. And that's where I'm refining all of that information into you know, the actual story. Like, it's actually my manuscript that mm -hmm. I'm carrying around with me. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, that totally is a manuscript. Yeah. It's the thumbnail of the book, right? It's a dummy yeah. of the book, so that, gotcha. it's essentially a comic book manuscript. Um, but that only happens when, it, like, it becomes project-based. Uh, what I need to solve is how to do non-project-based curation. And it seems like some of the things that you threw at me today, Rob, uh, are good food for thought. And especially just like, if I've got a day of the week where I do inspiration hoarding, I should have a day of the week, an evening of the week, where I spend an hour going through that information and refining it somehow and, and, and curating it. Um, but. I, yeah, I do find, uh, yeah, that's helped me uh, as far as Picking which tools I prefer for for what things, and it, I mean, it's just it's helpful in general. It's it's good to know what you have. Good to to walk your uh, your own your own library and see what's see what's on the shelf. Well, <clears throat> Rob, we are running. We're fast running out of time. <laughs> we are. I know. We're totally oh. gambling with the with the Google Plus. Well, we will. Um... We, we're going to revisit this. We're going to revisit this again because ideas are going to change, technology is going to change, and our approaches are going to change. And we would love to hear from you guys what you guys are doing so that we can uh, evaluate. You know, this is this is that peer review thing. Like, what are you guys doing? What are, what are you? Uh, how? What, what are your approaches? I can measure them against my approaches and find out if there's any new way to do it. Right. Uh, so thank you, Rob, for walking around this one with me. That was that was fun. Yeah, thank you, Jersey. This is thank you. The... Thank you for making uh, <laughs> uh, researching fun. <laughs> I yeah, it wasn't and to begin with. <laughs> oh. it, it's a topic that has a reputation. Hmm. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so if you if if you the listener if you the leaner thought that this was fun, then a way you could you know. Uh, let us know is by going to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lean into art. And there you can find not only this show, but the extra show we record in between called Extra Lean. And you can find the daily microcast that Rob and I have been posting as part of the Art Sound Off Challenge. Uh, if you feel the urge, you can contribute, even if it's like a buck a month. 
uh, to help us bring this thing up to our sustainable trade milestone where we're actually getting our all of our time is being compensated for for producing the show because it does take a fair amount of time it's not only a two-hour show but there's the hours of research and production that go into uh, you know organizing the the show as as well as we do uh, but Let's say you don't want to you don't want to flip us a buck. You don't want to give us a tip. Another thing you can do that's absolutely free is you go to iTunes, give us a, get a star review, however many stars you think we deserve. You don't even have to write a review, but if you write a review, that makes us happy too. We read them. We appreciate every kind word that's shared. I can't believe that as far as far as I know right now, uh, all of our reviews are five star reviews. Rob, how crazy is that? Whoa. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about yeah, that's me super a, cool. Thank you. Uh, bunch everyone who's done that that's super cool thank you very much yeah super awesome it helps more people find the show if you're watching the video on youtube a great way you can help more people find the show is give the video a thumbs up you don't even have to write anything you don't have to do any comments oh uh, for god's sakes youtube comments we all know about that so how about you just give it a thumbs up to say hey i like this thing that'll help more people discover the show raises it in the search rankings and then check out the arts uh art sound off challenge and i want to thank the people who have been participating so far uh owen jolens who is uh, at Comics Colorist on Twitter, Nathan Seabolt, at N underscore Seabolt on Twitter, Robin White, at Dudes, D-O-O-D-Z-E on Twitter, Ashley Knapp, who's gotten lots of mentions on the show, Control-Alt-Lee on Twitter, Bitsfair, at B-I-T-S-F-A-I-R on Twitter, uh, all participating in this thing, all creating daily audio journals, and it's been really, really fun to listen to you guys, not only sharing what you're working on, but listening to you guys and watching you guys all interact with one another i think it's super great and uh i, I think if you are a visual storyteller looking for more interesting things to put in your ears while you're working in the studio do go to artsoundoff.com to, and there's a link at the bottom to follow the hashtag on twitter so you can see all the neat things that people are posting and talking about that's uh that that's quite a bit who <laughs> who knew like a few weeks ago that we'd be doing this but yeah this is super <laughs> cool so november is quite the month of uh of of yeah content to accompany you at the art desk yeah while you're or taking you're other art challenges like yeah. uh, nanorimo or the 30 characters challenge by our buddy tyler james 30 characters.com redraw a character a day while you're doing that listen to the art sound off challenge and then Share your experiences taking on these creative challenges by creating another thing in the Art Sound Off Challenge, right? <laughs> Reflecting yes. and making things. Yes. I like it. That is the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got a motor. Uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading, watching, and listening. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with another show. Until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user LeanIntoArt. And you can reach us via email at LeanIntoArt at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'm going to shut down the stream. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.